I have spent the past 26 years advising leaders of organizations, primarily in the business world, but also in academia and in NGOs, serving as a sounding board to them on how to be more effective in their roles. What has given me the authority and credibility to do this? At the beginning, virtually nothing. I was at a cocktail party in 1995, having a conversation with the young CEO of an internet startup when a light bulb went off in my head. As some of you who are therapists will no doubt attest, one of the occupational hazards of being a shrink at a cocktail party, once you've made your occupation known, is that this attracts certain people to you who then proceed to unburden themselves. I've always rather liked this because I'm deeply curious about other people and enjoy listening to their stories and trying to be helpful if I can. I've also been plagued with a persistent case of bluntness, a lack of tact that has probably served me well over time. This man at the cocktail party, after what I imagined was his second glass of wine, told me that he was the co-founder and CEO of an internet startup in the early days of the first dot-com boom. To spare those of you who've heard me tell this story before, I'll cut to the chase. As my new acquaintance talked about some of the challenges he was experiencing as the boss of his business, I asked some questions, made a few observations, and offered a suggestion or two. As the conversation was coming to a close, he said, Kerry, this has been really helpful. You've gotten me to think about things in a new way. When could you start advising me and my company? I was taken aback and said, and here comes one of the tactless parts, that's really kind of you to ask, but I think you're out of your mind. Who obviously, you obviously need help, but uh, shouldn't you hire somebody who does that for a living? What you've been talking about is really interesting to me, and I've enjoyed speaking to you, but I see patients all day. That was what I said. He then replied with something that changed my life. He said, the fact that you just told a CEO that he's out of his mind makes me want to hire you even more. Ever since I've become a CEO, nobody talks straight to me anymore. That was my light bulb moment. It gave me the idea that there might be something to this notion of bringing a psychoanalytic perspective to bear and serving as an advisor to leaders. I agree with Doris Salcedo, a renowned Colombian artist whose work will be constantly alluding throughout this lecture when she states that we Colombians, we all are survivors of war. Despite many significant facts, for example, that I grew up seeing the most atrocious images on national TV news, or that I can never forget the dramatic change in the behavior of a classmate who lost his mom at the Palace of Justice siege when we were only five years old, or that as a teenager, my friends and I would be thrilled when our classes were disrupted for an emergency drill to deal with a potential terrorist attack from a drug cartel. And above all this, despite the fact that my family had told me the atrocities committed against my grandparents for belonging to the wrong political party in their town, I had not realized that I was indeed a survivor of war. On the other hand, when I attended some of the art performances and installations created as a homage to millions of victims in Colombia, I really got in touch with the painful feeling of having grown up in a country at war. Then I realized that the hundreds of interviews that artists like Doris Salcedo and Jesus Abad Colorado in Colombia, but also Svetlana Alexievich in Belorussia conducted with people who were impacted by the war, were communicating something that resembles the psychoanalytic task. The artists I just mentioned seem to be guided by the same lighthouse. In the words of Alexievich, to write not about war, but about human beings in war, human beings in war, the insurmountable tragedy of life, its chaos and passion, its uniqueness and inscrutability. These similarities between the artistic and the psychoanalytic task became a source of inspiration to set up a conversation on art and psychoanalysis with the aim of recreating the irreparable damage caused by violence in victims of war in subsequent generations and furthermore 
in the minds of a specific social group. Today's aim, to offer a psychoanalytic view of how to understand turning away from seeing reality and ending up playing with risk. I shall argue that the development of, con of the conscious mind creates something amazing that is also a vulnerability. My claim is that the curiosity drive is the means by which human beings turn to look at reality, but the conscious mind created in this way can turn a thinking space into an omnipotent fantasy that provides comfort. I shall suggest that this is the logical consequence of applying Beyond's ideas about the development of thinking. And so we need to turn to the background. I need to begin by describing the change that Beyond made to how we understand the creation of the conscious mind. Melanie Klein had described the emotional links the baby makes. She talked about loving the good breast and hating the bad breast. As many of you know, I prefer to talk about yummy, yummy, mummy and the hunger monster because I think that's closer to the baby's experience. Either way, this creates an experience of a universe sharply divided between perfect love and perfect hate. She called this the paranoid schizoid position, but I believe she was describing the same state of mind that human beings share with animals governed by the pleasure principle as described by Freud in his theory of how behavior is organized by drives. Now at first sight, this picture doesn't look like it makes any reference to drives, but Bion, who renamed Melanie Klein's good and bad as love and hate, and then to be consistently Bion-esque L and H, was talking about drives that are innate and pointing out that those drives make emotional links. So he immediately connects the emotional link with the drive. And of course, this links with an important piece of information that is often overlooked, which is that the organisms, our, we experience psychic activity in the brain in the form of affects or feelings. When these are raw, they're experienced as intense unpleasure. Hence Freud's deduction that the animal is so organized to take action to reduce unpleasure. What Bion did, and this is the point that I take off my thinking, is he added to those two drives, L and H, K. He called this the urge to know, but I call it curiosity. 